What's up, everybody? You got questions, I guess, huh? Everybody's filling up my email box with viewer questions, which is totally cool. Uh, you got to let me get some work done every once in a while, though. I got a church to lead here and books to write and articles to, to publish. But uh, hey, thanks for writing me questions. I appreciate that. I suppose that suggests that you trust the answers that you're going to get from me. And to that extent, I'm very flattered uh, by uh, your willingness to entrust your your profound questions and dilemmas to me as a, as a pastor and a, as a theologian, I suppose. Um, so let's do this. If you do have questions for me, um, you can get a hold of me through my about page on this YouTube channel. I usually try not to just post my email and or say it. I don't know why. Um, I just figure it's going to get picked up in some computer algorithm. So that's why I give it in my YouTube about page. And even still, it's a little bit mysterious. You have to kind of figure it out, which it's not hard to do. But you just read the about page and figure out my email and then email me there. I'd actually rather that than the Facebook messages um, for reasons. But um, people ask me questions on Facebook messages, too. They're just harder to keep track of. I have a file of YouTube questions. And anyways, you're looking at how the sausage is made here, I guess, to some extent. But uh, today we're going to answer a number of questions. I'm going to do so somewhat rapid fire. So these questions are not going to get the full half an hour or anything like that. But since you asked me, I thought I'd take the time to answer. And um, sometimes it's easier to say something than to write it out. So here we go. Um, before we get into the questions, I did want to say welcome to this channel. My name is Matthew Everhart. I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship PCA. We are a Reformed Bible-believing church just north of Pittsburgh. We would love for you to come visit us in real life. And you are, by the way, um, five weeks in a row, we've had somebody who watches this channel on YouTube come visit us in real life at Gospel Fellowship. So that is so cool. Thank you so much. By the way, I will get to the questions in a second. I promise I have a big announcement coming. And I know you're thinking, oh, it's your book. No, no. Set the book aside. That's coming out in October. Um, we'll talk about that later. I'm not here to promote it. But I have a really exciting announcement that I'm going to share with you. I hope to do so on Friday. So if you'll tune in with me on Friday, this Friday, I really want to tell you something that's super awesome. And um, it's not about me at all. So it's not a personal announcement. It's just something that God is doing that's really, really cool. And you might even be a part of it somehow. And I'm trusting that some of you will. So please check out this YouTube channel on Friday. All right, well, let's get into the questions. Um, I'm going to read them briefly and then give a brief answer. There's 10 of them. So here we go. First of all, this is from Riley. What's up, Riley? He says, I understand you switched from the EPC to the PCA. Well, not recently, but that is true. If you don't mind me asking, was there any reason in particular you chose the PCA over the OPC? I joined the OPC after converted two years ago, and I'm discerning seminary and ministry generally, and I would like to get a hold of the lay of the land of what conservative Presbyterian denominations there are. Okay, he goes on. What's up, Riley? So I didn't actually choose the PCA over the OPC. It's not like when you're going to buy a car and you're looking through the lots, and here's a Cadillac, and here's a Mercedes, and here's, well, more likely for me, it'd be like a Chevy Prism or something like that, or a Nissan Versa, which is what I actually drive. Um, you're not choosing a denomination like you're choosing a car. I'm not choosing a denomination like I'm choosing uh, whole milk or 2%. When you are called by a church, that church typically already has a denominational affiliation. Now, in your case, you're a little bit different from me because you're on the earlier half of seminary and your future is in front of you. So, yes, it would be good to know a little bit about the various reform denominations. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I've only been a part of two. I was originally ordained in the EPC, and then after 11 years of doing ministry in the EPC, I moved to the PCA. Now, I like them both, and I did do a whole video on why I moved from the EPC to the PCA. In essence, I really enjoyed my time with the EPC. They're wonderful people. They have a, a very um, great esprit de corps. The unity there is fantastic. They're evangelical and reformed, as the name suggests. Uh, there were a few weirdisms, though, with the EPC that I wanted to move away from, such as its uh, more charismatic side and its ordination of women, not only as deacons and elders, but sometimes as pastors, which I'm totally not cool with that. And so I did want to be a part of a, re a reformed and complementarian denomination. For me, if you're going to ask me what I would want to be a part of, um, well, Gospel Fellowship that called me is a PCA church. So that's my team. That's the jersey that I wear. And I love the PCA. 
I'm fitting in very well, and to some extent, this fits me much better than the EPC. Um, but if I was choosing the denomination as I was choosing a car, I would probably pick the PCA, to be honest. But the OPC and the ARP and the RPCNA would all be in the running. Um, I do have quite a few contacts and contacts in the RPCNA, which is the most conservative of the whole spectrum. So don't don't rule that one out. Uh, they have some great things to commend. Now the RPCNA is a Psalms only regulative principle denomination. So if that's not for you, then the, the RPCNA probably wouldn't be either. But I'm actually quite open to psalm singing. Uh, at the moment, I'm a psalms inclusivist rather than a psalms exclusivist, so I don't quite fit the parameters of the RPCNA. However, I do highly recommend the RPTS Seminary um, in Pittsburgh, of which I am on the President's Council, not to brag, but it's true. Anyways, I love those guys there, and I would totally recommend you check into RPTS. And if you do give them a call, please drop my name and let them know that you heard about RPTS through my YouTube channel. Um, I would definitely give the RPCNA a good look, as well as the OPC, as well as the ARP. Uh, my mentor, Dr. Bellamy, who's with the Lord now, he was the stated clerk of the ARP. Don't rule those guys out. They have a solid Reformed confessional history as well. In fact, they're the oldest continuing Reformed denomination, so don't forget to check into the ARP. But as for the PCA versus the OPC, although Gospel Fellowship is a PCA church um, and I don't have a lot of contacts in the OPC, maybe that's why I didn't really consider that direction, um, I think probably any of those would, would fit you well. Um, so if I had it to do over again and suppose I was choosing a denomination, I would probably say the PCA, OPC, RPCNA, what did I leave out? OPC, PCA, RPCNA, and the ARP, any one of those four would probably be the ones that I'm looking into. Okay, they all share the Westminster Confession of Faith. They're all solidly reformed and biblical as far as I'm concerned. They have some variances between them. Some of that variance is cultural and in terms of style, but I think all of them are faithful to the Lord. All right, second question. This is from Joel. What's up, Joel? Joel says, my name is Joel. I'm from Sweden. Well, that's cool. If you were from Sweden, I'm also... Uh, usually quite impressed always with how many places people watch me from. That's neat. Thanks. Uh, Joel says, I found Jesus in a Pentecostal church uh, and now in a free mission church. I don't know what that one is. Maybe that's a Swedish denomination. He says, I, does, I don't have my theological education, but it's yet to come. And here's this question. He says, I've thought a lot about predestination, which we have in the book of Romans. This led me to the Reformed view with Calvin and Luther. Do you have some book tips you could give me on the fundamentals of Reformed churches? Sure. Well, first of all, predestination, of course, is biblical. There's no denying that. No matter what perspective you take on these issues, predestination is in the Bible. It's in Romans. It's in Ephesians. It's in other places as well. In fact, almost every New Testament author, with very few exceptions, talks about either predestination or election or the elect or us having been chosen. And amongst the biblical canon, the books of Romans, Ephesians, and probably John's gospel are going to talk about it the most, although it's in other places, the Psalms and Deuteronomy, etc. Um, if I was going to read a couple of books on the topic, you'd be right to name the name of Martin Luther. In fact, his book, The Bondage of the Will, I've done a whole review on that book on this channel. And The Bondage of the Will is a strongly predestinarian Augustinian book on that topic. Um, I would also recommend a couple of books as well. Go with R.C. Sproul's Chosen by God, R.C. Sproul's What is Reformed Theology, and then my professor, John Frame's book, Salvation Belongs to the Lord. All of those books are going to be excellent, and they're going to give you a good introduction into Reformed thought. What is Reformed Theology by R.C. Sproul talks primarily about the five solas of the Reformation, sola fide, sola gratia, soli deo gloria, etc., um, but it also has a very good overview into what we mean in some of the broadest and general categories of Reformed theology, although it's not meant to be an entire systematic. John Frame's Salvation Belongs to the Lord is a very good book, very readable for most people, and that's going to give you a little bit more than just predestination and sovereignty issues. It's going to cover the broadest gamut of systematic theology, although in a very readable and easy-to-digest way. If you want to go further into the mystery of predestination and God's election, then R.C. Sproul's Chosen by God is going to be an excellent book. So maybe you might look those up. Perhaps I'll even link them in the description of this video. 
Richard, hello Richard. Richard says he recently discovered my channel. Thank you so much. Uh, he has a question about plagiarism from a video I did just a bit ago. He wants to clarify something that I said in my plagiarism video, and here's his question. He says, I recently preached an adult Sunday school series for my church, first time preaching. Congratulations on that, brother. He based the series on a book he read called The Overcoming Life by Pastor Jimmy Evans. Never heard of him. Maybe he's good. I don't know. He says, I make sure to explain to the congregation before the sermon that I was using this book as an outline for the study, and I also encourage them to purchase the book. His question is then, did he sin in plagiarizing? My answer to you, Richard, is no. Your conscience can be quite alleviated here. Uh, you did something that is totally acceptable in my view when it comes to plagiarism, and that is you based your series from the book, but you did not preach the book line for line, word for word, as though it were your own. And that's the deal with plagiarism, is when you're trying to deceive your audience with who is the original source of these ideas. Plagiarism, whether it's written or spoken, comes about when you present something that's clearly the intellectual property of another as though that were your original ideas. However, if you are to cite and to quote and to give credit to the author of the book, then you're well within your bounds and you are not plagiarizing. Think about, for instance, how many times in a college class or a seminary class or even a high school class, a teacher uses a textbook as the source for the lectures and is clearly working through that material but both the teacher and the taught know exactly what the book is that you're using. In fact, you did something that I'm sure the, uh, the excuse me, blah, the author of the book greatly appreciates, and that is that you told your audience what book you're using and you encouraged them to buy it. That's where the author would say, thank you very much for using my content. You encourage them to buy it, perhaps even encouraging some sales for that author. So yeah, if you're an author, you want your books to be used. Uh, people have used some of my books before, Hold Fast to Faith. I know some people have done some Sunday school classes on the Westminster Confession using that book. Of course, I appreciate that. And to the extent that the author acknowledges the source of the ideas and where they get their content from, then the audience is informed and you're informing the audience and there is no question of conscience at that point. Um, I suppose it would get a little bit hairy if you're teaching that particular book and you were directly quoting from it in such a way that your audience was unaware that you were directly quoting from it. But that's pretty hard to do because you'd have to memorize entire chunks of paragraphs and things like that. So chances are both you and the audience, as long as you're clear, are going to have this, you're going to be on the same page, no pun intended, as to the source of the ideas, your content. So Richard, you're good to go. Okay, Roger. What's up, Roger? Roger says he's a late in life career changer. Very recently before coming to Christ, completed a master's degree in marriage and family therapy. Congratulations on your master's degree. Although he went to a very secular and liberal university program. He says, and I'm paraphrasing a bit here, that he was immersed in some very secular ideas. And now, whenever anybody comes into his counseling office, uh, they are expecting to get a secular counseling session from Roger, who though now is a Christian. And so his question is, um, well, let's see. Uh, he says, I regret that I wasn't able to make a more sound career change decision and to go into Christian counseling when I was young enough to take that on. It appears I'm stuck now providing secular therapy and that causes me some pain. Okay, well, that's a tough question. Um, on one hand, Roger, your goal in life is to witness to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And you are to do that, Roger, whether you're swinging a hammer as a carpenter, whether you are a cobbler working on somebody's shoes, whether you're a painter uh, painting the outside of somebody's home, or whether you're a Christian counselor. Now, I'm not saying that you have to preach expository sermons to your clients who are expecting to hear secular therapeutic methods from you, but that doesn't mean that your Christian influence should not seep into the conversations in some level. In the same way, I think that a Christian uh, who happens to teach at a secular school or a Christian who happens to lecture at a secular university can work their worldview 
into some of the conversations eventually. Now, obviously, your clients may be disappointed when they find out you're Christian, but if so, then that's, not, that's on them. Um, to the extent that you're able to talk about the real issues of the soul, emptiness, depression, meaning in life, significance, uh, one having a mission or a purpose to exist, um, even how relationships interact and what strong marriages look like. There, there's a broad degree to which you can interject the Christian faith into these things without um, opening up your Bible and preaching expository sermons. I do think you can do that. Not only that, Roger, but you can model your Christian faith in the way that you treat your clients, in the way that you treat your coworkers, and the way that you talk about your own experiences such as they are. So what I would do, Roger, is again, here's going to be another advertisement for RPTS <laughs> in Pittsburgh, uh, but they have an amazing Christian counseling program there. And what I would do, if I were you, is supplement my secular education with some very Christian, intentionally Christian content so that you can begin to identify issues, life issues, in some of the ways that a Christian counselor might identify root issues of sin, uh, depravity, loneliness, guilt. Um, you got to deal with guilt, whether you're doing secular or Christian counseling, right? Because it's there in the human heart. Uh, but you might be able to see some things in a different way if you were to catch up on some of what you might have missed had you been trained formally as a Christian counselor. Neuthetic counseling is the idea that we exhort from the position of scriptural authority. And you might even be able to slowly change the traje trajectory of your counseling um, practice as you slowly import more and more overt Christian ideology into your counseling discussions. But certainly it would be worth that change over time in my view. All right, well, Roger, we'll be praying for you, brother. I hope that you could show them Christ in one way or another in the counseling office. Mitchie, what's up, Mitchie? <laughs> it's like Mitch, but with a Y. Uh, Mitch says, hello, he recently discovered my channel. Thank you very much. By the way, appreciate all the compliments. You don't need to give them, though. Um, makes me feel good, but that's not the point. Mitchie says, I thought I'd ask you to do a video tackling slavery mentioned in Leviticus 25. It's a struggle with my walk. I don't uh, really know what to think of it, honestly. If you're unable to do a video, any commentaries or writings on the subject you'd recommend? Wow, tough question. Um, well, a couple things come to mind on this topic. First of all, this. There is uh, the intellectual fallacy of the anachronism. Anachronism against chronology. Um, to, to think anachronistically is to interpret something in the past through the lens of the present or the future. And that can be fallacious when we come to the Bible because the Bible is written in an ancient context. So, for instance, if I say, here, stupid example, but sometimes people will come to the Greek word dunamis, and they'll say, well, this is the same Greek word as the word dynamite, <laughs> which, as far as I understand it, came about later. Um, so, no, the word dynamite comes from dunamis, but not the other way around. We don't want to think anachronistically. In other words, the New Testament authors weren't talking about dynamite's explosive power, power when they're using the word dunamis in the text. And similar things happen when we think of some of these sociological or societal issues like slavery. So you see the word slavery or slave or bond servant in your Bible, and what do you think of? Well, your mind jumps ahead to the 1600s, 1700s, and the 1800s with regard to African chattel slavery here in the Americas or in the colonies, right? And it's hard to divorce our mind uh, from interpreting the Old Testament text in light of what we know to be part of our nation's past or the past of more recent Western world phenomenon. But that's anachronistic. That is to import a much later event into the Old Testament text, when in, whereas in fact, Old Testament slavery is quite different from the African chattel slavery of the colonial era. And so one of the things I would recommend that you might do, Mitchy is to begin to do a study on those very texts. Don't make me do your homework for you. You get out your notebook, your Bible, and your pencil, and you begin cataloging all the ways that Old Testament slavery is similar and dissimilar to African chattel slavery. What you'll find 
is that the Old Testament is far more gracious in its treatment of those slaves. Uh, you'll find, for instance, that people volunteered to be slaves. Well, why would they do that? Well, sometimes they were working themselves out of a debt, for instance. Uh, you'll find that there is times in which slavery is automatically ended. Well, that didn't happen in African chattel slavery. You were a slave for life. You'll find that there's rules about hurting or injuring your slaves in the Old Testament. And again, it wasn't like that under the colonial form of imperialistic slavery. And so what you might do is realize that you've imported a far more modern concept into an ancient world situation and that you've misjudged what's actually happening in Leviticus 25 based on those factors. So what I would do is I would set up a Venn diagram. Now you know a Venn diagram are two circles that overlap each other, right? And so they have some ways that they're different and some ways that they're similar. So as you're doing the study on your own, uh, set up one circle that represents the slavery that we think of in our nation's more recent past, and another circle that is the biblical form of slavery in the Old Testament, and try to delineate what these two things are in difference, and then in the area of overlap, what they have in common, and sort of try to evaluate then how much that is really a true parallel in, to, in, in terms of these historical overworkings, all right? Um, hope that helps. Think about it that way, perhaps. Okay, Bernard. What's up, Bernard, my man? Good to see you. Watching from Europe, another European. Hello. Um, I, I get the sense from this email that English might not be his first language, and there's an indicator in the question itself. So he says, hello, Pastor. Watching some of your YouTube videos. Um, appreciates my advice. He says, my family and I have been members in a church for about four years now, and many times I've confronted the pastor that we are uh, going to leave the church, but he refused to let us go. Okay, there's a warning right there, right? The reason we decided to leave the church is connected to the language that they speak in church. We are in England and the church is purely local where they worship in a Ghana dialect. But we are from another country. Okay, so that's why I'm assuming that maybe English isn't your first language. Although, Bernard, your written English is perfect. Okay, so I, I, you're doing fantastic. Um, he says he doesn't understand anything at all in the worship service. And now because of us, they are doing interpretation in English after everything that's in the dialect. We're not enjoying the service as we ought. Please, what should we do? But the man of God will not let us leave. Okay, so, hmm, kind of strange. What do you mean that he won't let you leave? That sounds a little bit like a red flag to me. Um, pastors don't really have ultimate control over their par parishioners such that they can't leave without their permission. Maybe what you're meaning by that is he wouldn't transfer your membership because churches do sometimes communicate to one another about transferring membership from one church to another via letter. Um, unless there's something particular going on, like a church disciplinary situation or something like that. So maybe that's what you mean by he won't let you leave. But um, without knowing more about the situation, it definitely alerts my red flags to pop up. You would think that a pastor would understand that the service is not even in your language. And of course, you're going to have a hard time understanding the worship service if you don't speak the language in which the service is taking place in. So it sounds to me like Bernard is trying to seek out a church in which his language, the one that he speaks and understand, understands, is spoken fluently. If that's the case, then yes, I do think that would be a justifiable reason to leave your church. Now, for the viewer who's just watching, the subtext here is that Bernard is responding to my video from a week or so ago about reasons that one might leave a church. And I suggested that heresy or ministerial malpractice or even taking up a new call in ministry might be justifying reasons. And he's wondering if these linguistic considerations might be added to the list. And I do think that that's probably a good one. Um, Bernard, I would say this, if you and your family don't understand the worship service and you can't understand the preaching or the singing or the liturgy or the scriptures as they're being read, then by all means, brother, you should be free in your conscience to pursue a church in which you can be edified intelligibly by the ministry of the word. I think that the Corinthian correspondence in the chapter, chapter 14 would suggest the same thing. So I do think that would be a justifiable reason to leave a church. Okay, uh, next question. This one is from a person called N. I'm not going to say his name because I happen to know N, and he comes from a Muslim-majority country. 
and I don't know if he would be in any danger in being identified. So I'm not going to say his name, but it starts with an N. He says, hello, this is a dumb question, but please help me. I saw the number 666 three times today, which is the mark of the beast. This has never happened to me before. Is this just a coincidence or a sign that says something bad is about to happen? What does this mean? Well, I don't know exactly. On one hand, my friend N, we can say that nothing that happens in this world is ever a coincidence because God is sovereign over every raindrop, every cloud, every snowflake that falls. God is the one who moves the hearts of kings. He sends famines and pestilences. God controls history on the macro level, which is to say the big picture, and the micro level, which is to say the small picture. Even down to the very details of our lives, even the fingerprints on our fingers, even the DNA and our drops of blood, it is all under the sovereign control and care of God. So it could mean something. However, I'm reticent to assign any particular meaning to this because I do think that this could simply be a confluence of circumstances. Um, if you drive home today and you see eight yellow cars on the road, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're supposed to interpret some sort of a sign or an omen from it. In fact, more times than not, we're not supposed to interpret signs and omens and look for deeper meanings and fortune cookie explanations and reading the tea leaves and things like that. Our primary uh, source of truth is simply the Word of God. And so I don't take this to mean anything particular that you've done bad or that there's some sign that something terrible is about to happen to you. Not at all. If anything, it might be alerting you to, well, uh, God's sovereignty. And, of course, we do know that the number 666 comes from the book of Revelation. And many people have tried to figure out what this means, of course, as one of those deep Bible mysteries. But most of the better Bible scholars and Bible commentators have interpreted this as a form of numerology. In the ancient world, and sometimes in the scriptures, they would often take uh, each uh, letter and assign a number to them and speak in somewhat of a code. And better Bible scholars than I figured out that if you add up the numerology to the number 666, it roughly equates to the name of Nero Caesar, who was the emperor at the time of the writing of the book of Revelation. And so uh, this most likely refers to Nero, the evil and wicked emperor, and the persecution that he caused the church to endure. Um, and I don't think that it's something that we're supposed to be searching for in today's world. Um, I think that mystery has pretty much been resolved in the numerological interpretation of Nero, the emperor, uh, now, why you would see that three times in a day, brother, I don't know. Um, but if it makes you feel guilt, uh, all I would say is, you know, you believe the gospel, right? Trust the gospel, confess your sins, confess your known sins, confess your unknown sins, and then move on with a clear conscience and a ready heart to obey and to follow after Christ. Uh, maybe this could mean that God is alerting you to persecution and suffering in this world that Christians are experiencing and simply to pray for them. But other than that, I take a very cautious approach when it comes to these sorts of omens and more times than not, I think they're more or less meaningless other than that we should search, search <laughs> we should search out the meaning of scripture as our ultimate and final authority. Okay, so I wouldn't take it in a bothersome way. All right, a um, couple more questions here. Stephen says, what about the days of creation in the book of Genesis? He has the ESV study Bible, and it indicates that there's four different ways that the creation days can be interpreted. Uh, he mentions uh, a book, A Matter of Days, by Ross. I do have that book, although I'm not an old earth creationist as Ross is. But he wants to know particularly about the PCA's view on the days of creation. Um, well, that's a great question, Stephen. Thank you so much for asking. Actually, the PCA did a marvelous study on creation a number of years ago, and you can find it simply by Googling the phrase PCA creation study. And in that study, the scholars who got together to work on it talked about each one of the major views of creation and which ones of them are acceptable in a reformed framework. Now, um, I will simply say this. 
In terms of an exception to the Westminster Confession of Faith, I, I do think that the Westminster Confession teaches a six-day creation. It says that God made the world in the space of six days. So it seems to indicate the six-day view. But the Westminster divines were familiar with other views, including uh, the gap view or the day-age view. St. Augustine famously articulated a non-six-day view of creation. So the Westminster divines were obviously aware of the tensions and had been talking about young earth versus old earth thing, things as well. Um, and so the Westminster Confession of Faith is somewhat vague, although if you pressed me, I would say the confession teaches a six-day creation view, which happens to be my view. Um, but this document, the PCA Creation Study, does a marvelous job of working through uh, some of the strengths and weaknesses of each of the various views, including the day-age view, the old age, uh, old earth view, the gap view, and the framework view. Now, there are a couple of presbyteries in the PCA that will not allow the exception of anything but the six-day view. So with that as the only qualification, I would say that broadly, several of those views are acceptable within the PCA. But you might want to be familiar with which presbytery you would belong to if you would have to take that as an exception. All right, thanks, Stephen, for the question. Lyle says, and this is going to be my last question, uh, long email here, but he basically started attending a PCA church in, let's see, Tennessee. All right. That's great, Lyle. Glad you're doing that. He wants to know, though, about crosses in the sanctuary because every church he's ever been to has had crosses in the sanctuary, and this one does not. So what's up with that? In fact, he mentions in the email that either he or his wife, I forget which one it is, they wear a cross necklace, and they're wondering if that's permissible. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, Lyle, in the PCA, there's a mixed practice when it comes to crosses as decor in the worship space. And that is for this reason. Actually, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, of course, in the Reformed tradition, we have a very conservative view when it comes to any kinds of images whatsoever. All right, read uh, the larger catechism on the second commandment, LC 109, larger catechism 109. We are very, very hesitant to use any kinds of imagery in our worship services because we don't want to break the second commandment on the use of idols or uh, any sorts of images that would portray God or any other thing that might affect our worship. And the reason that we do that is because scripture doesn't commend the use of any images for God or the gods or anything like that. So with that in mind, the second answer is that in the Reformed tradition, most of our worship sanctuaries have been influenced by the architecture of the Puritan plain style meeting house. Now, the moment I say that, you're going to tell me you know an exception of a Presbyterian church that's conservative in its theology that has stained glass images of the saints or of Jesus or crosses or things like this. And so, yes, there is a mixed practice. But by and large, in the PCA, you're not going to see this imagery related to the persons of the Trinity. And sometimes you're not even going to see the cross at all. I'm trying to think about our building here at Gospel Fellowship. We definitely don't have a cross in the sanctuary. Um, we don't have many crosses at all in our decor, although I believe that they are very small on our communion cups. Um, so it's not something that we feature. Now, don't get me wrong. We're not against the crucifixion of Christ. Of course we believe in the crucifixion of Christ. It's the very center of our hope. But because of our heritage with the plain style meeting house of the Puritans, our decor is usually quite sparse. In fact, we believe that the great, um, the great sensations that are to be expressed is the preaching and the hearing of the word. Okay, so very tangible, tactile experience with the word of God, so to speak. And then the elements of the sacraments, the water of baptism, the bread and the sweetness of the cup and the Lord's Supper. These are the overt sense oriented, tangible factors in our worship services, but we tend not to use any kinds of imagery, images, icons or idols that could in some way confuse the worshiper. Okay, so it's a very ordinary means of grace understanding of what worship is. We certainly don't pray to or through stained glass or images or icons of various shapes or forms, statues, things like that. We just don't have them as the Catholics and the Orthodox do, the Lutherans and the Anglicans too. We just don't do any of that stuff. 
Now, you may say that's an overreaction on the part of uh, the Puritan reformers and the Presbyterians in particular, but I think it does safeguard the regulative principle of worship, and so therefore we're very careful. Now, is anyone going to bust you for having a cross necklace? Probably not. Most people aren't going to say anything. Most people aren't even going to notice. Um, but that's probably the explanation for why there's not a cross in the sanctuary. Okay. Well, hopefully uh, that was helpful on some of these questions, more or less. I'm just shooting from the hip here a little bit today. I didn't really prepare any of the answers very much. But uh, thank you so much for watching. I do love you lots. Hey, don't forget, I have a big announcement coming on Friday. This is really, really cool stuff. And it's not about me. It's something that, that God is doing that's really awesome. So anyways, thanks for checking in. Do love you lots. I'll post a couple of links in the description of this video so you can get the books that I recommended. And I'll talk with you later.